Zoom you in. Just want to see what's going on and potentially say something and somebody not out to the great public, it's something that could be conveyed, you know, when the camera is on. more easier for me to like bring a projector and just use some wall yeah. space but uh, prints and stuff is fine also it's just more are better okay the projector it's like our space is so multi-purpose mm -hmm. that it's like we have to constantly moving it around and stuff i just wouldn't want to like okay i mean like for because it's, it's going to be up for more than like a disability pride event anyway um so i think it'd be okay well but, but, but for just the day 
if yeah. I brought it. Like, it's just the day. Let me check in with the other co-organizers and see what they Okay, and it's also just like lighting too. If it's like, you know, yeah. really bright in there, then it's not the best for projector and stuff. Totally. It's like... I can always come down beforehand and you know, test it out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. This right here, this this square two feet. Okay. Right here.
Um, and here we have Wildberries, Marketplace, the North Coast Co-op, Eureka Natural Foods. These are all examples, by the way, of DP businesses that have developed and succeeded here in Humboldt County. Independent, not corporate, the profits are redistributed here in the community. So this is an example of what's been done and what we can keep doing. As well, on our sponsors, we have the Ganjuri, Chris Lounge in Eureka, great place. Excuse um, me. Canifest, who's putting on a really cool festival coming up in September. We have Kiss Canoe, beautiful products. Um, and we also have the Humboldt County Visitors Bureau. Thank Excuse you for me. their support. Oh. Um, you step like one one step to the right, I've got a, a live video thing going here. Cool. Thank you. I'm just going to be floating around. I'm not going to say Oh, no problem. Yeah. Finally, just a very brief thank you to Pat. The owner of Wrangell Town, this is her place. Thank you, Pat. And also thank you to the team at the Arcade Playhouse because we spent quite a few hours this afternoon setting up the sounds and the lights here to make it all possible. So a big thank you to the Playhouse. And at last, a couple of partners in the community that are really helping us bring these stories out to the light. And here I am saying thank you, Kim Kemp. Red-headed black belt. She's been publishing weekly installments uh, that are written by Scott of the Humboldt Area People's Archive. So check it out. There is always a story. There was recently a story around um, the genesis of the uh, Redwood uh, Redwood Rural Health Center. Health Center. <laughs> That's right. Um, and also thank you to facilities that have made it possible for us to display our collections as we are doing our public launch and coming out with these materials. The Solstice Collective at the Clark Museum in Eureka is displaying two of our collections, one on the Civil Liberties Monitoring Project and another one on Independent Press from the Underground. Uh, we will also shortly be making the Office of the Civil Liberties Monitoring Project open to the public as a historic site. There are here some figures of that remarkable endeavor in Southern Humboldt, grassroots organizing to keep in check government um, egregious abuses. And so thank you to them for their work. And we are preserving the place for the historic site. You know this, I'm going to hand it over to Greg Castillo. Thank you so much, Greg, for coming here from UC Berkeley, who will be moderating our panel. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. And before I say anything else, I think that uh, we should give a big shout out to Nicole, whose incredible energy has put all of this together in the show. Structure. Um, we have some wonderful people uh, talking to us about some of the activism that's happened that really, I think, is part of the reason that counterculture legacy is so important to remember. And there are very many younger people who I teach as undergraduates who are really picking up on this and are interested in the counterculture in a way that maybe pre previous generations of college students have not been interested in for a while. And I think one of the reasons is that they can understand the importance of actually direct action in changing the present into a livable future. It's never been more important. And I think this is one of the things that the counterculture really pioneered. So um, I'm just going to first briefly introduce all of us. Then each of us are going to do maybe 15 minute maps, just telling you the kind of work we're involved in. Uh, and it ranges from some academic work like mine to kind of uh, journalistic work like yours, and then actually community activism that's really engaged in uh, improving this situation of the Humboldt Town community. Uh, so then we'll have our read presentations, and then we will open it up for a more open discussion. So I'm Greg Castillo, I'm a professor at Berkeley in the Department of Architecture. My work is really on, uh, is that there? Is yes. on, uh, yeah, is on uh, our architecture and its relationship to culture. 
And I'll tell you more about that in the uh, sort of little PowerPoint that I'm going to show. Uh, Ruth Dussault is an environmental journalist uh, who works in film, uh, geography, ethnography, and design, and most recently a graduate of the program in journalism at the master's level at Cal. Uh, and I'll give a little more about this uh, as we go along. Then, uh, Leslie uh, Castellano is an artist, a Eureka City Council member, arts and culture administrator. Uh, uh, Roby Tenorio lives on the Matola River at the confluence of Matola Canyon Creek, and she grows food, practices stream and land restoration with volunteers on community projects. Sunshine Cerceda was one of the first cannabis dry farmers in Humboldt County. These are kinds of of course, without uh, environmental uh, damage and impact. And uh, Lorraine Carolyn has lived in Humboldt County since 1969 and is a community-based birth and health worker. So if I could uh, have, and oh, by the way, you're seeing a lovely little film that uh, Ruth has made uh, based on her work on contemporary counterculture practices. Uh, this uh, wonderful juggler doing his magic act. So uh, if I could ask for these lights to be turned off, can we do that for the duration of the... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. So, um, in the summer of 2017, uh, as a commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love, I was a guest curator of a show called Fifty Modernism at the Berkeley Art Museum. And uh, this exhibition originally began and was produced by the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Not exactly a California-oriented organization. So my job when it came to uh, Berkeley was to add material, about 150 artifacts and images, that would explain more about California as really a, what we know it as, the heart of counterculture practices. Uh, and uh, so in the process of putting together and installing this uh, exhibition that came from elsewhere, and if I could ask you to advance one slide, Ruth. One of the images that we show, which is familiar to most architecture students, is an image created by an avant-garde architectural collective uh, in the early 1970s. That collective is called Super Studio. And the image is of a project that they call a negative utopia. The negative utopia was an idea of a postmodern landscape in which there was an infinite grid that supplied power and communications allowing people to become permanent nomads and live anywhere on the planet. And so uh, the project actually used a found photograph of a naked hippie family as a kind of metaphor or a kind of cipher that they wanted us to interpret as these nomads of the future. And so, of course, as the historian, I'm thinking like, whoa, wait, those are actually real people. Who are those people? I want to know who those people really are. Ruth, could you advance? So as it turned out, that image is in the photo archive at Stanford, and I was able to track down that this is a family called the Michels. The Michel family is John and Sue Michel, with their children from two marriages. Uh, you see them there. Tigger, Charlie, Heidi, and Peggy holding the sister Faith at the Wheeler's Ranch Open Land Commune in Sonoma. And uh, the irony of this being recycled in a project called A Negative Utopia is that this site was an actual utopia for this family. This was a homeless family that had been booted out of city after city, living in the van that you see behind them, until they found the Wheeler's Open uh, Land Commune, which welcomed anyone to come and move there. And so uh, really what this got me thinking about is this idea of how actual lives of people with real countercultural experience can so often be reduced to defamatory or kind of ridiculing stereotypes. Could we have the next slide? One of the things that occurred to me is that the way that Italians in 1970, used the image of those people was very much the way Europeans used images of Native Americans, 
who were distinctive from Europeans, as you see on the left, by their nakedness, and who were basically subjected to European projections of who they were. And that was the way that so many negative stereotypes were perpetuated about indigenous Americans. So one of the things I wanted to think about was how these counterculture stereotypes work. What is the work that these stereotypes do for mainstream society? Could I have the next slide, please? So these negative stereotypes were also uh, perpetrated by political activists on the left. The new left sort of tended to see uh, counterculture hippies as people who were apolitical, disengaged from political action because they were not actively involved in doing things like going to the Democratic National Convention in Chicago and doing that kind of political protest. So the, here's one stereotype, these are people who are apolitical. Can I have the next slide? Another stereotype is that the counterculture was just some other form of consumer culture. After all, they had their own fashions, they had their own hairstyles, they became mainstreamed, and as we see on the slide on the right, they even become the uh, title of a perfume released in 2011 called Hippie Chic. Or maybe it's supposed to be pronounced Hippie Chick. Who knows, but uh, it's this idea that hippies are kind of superficial proto-consumer society people. If you think about it, this is really blaming the victim. Hippies were taken for their imagery, for their fashion, and really commodified by other parties, by business parties. So this is a, a case of blaming the victim. That's where that stereotype comes from. Could I have the next slide? So what I wanted to do is to try to think about like what is the real legacy of the counterculture based on the counterculture's own values. And what I want to kind of introduce today is the idea of some keywords to try to see what did these keywords mean for the counterculture? What did they mean about counterculture practice? And how can we try to understand that legacy today as a vital legacy of value to us and something that actually resides in the Kappa archive. But there, that's where we'll find some of the documentation of these practices. So the first thing I'd like to bring up is the idea of what's so radical about the counterculture? Well, let's see how the counterculture defined these terms, love, free, and the outlaw, as their cultural keywords. And the first one I want to take on is love. So in our mainstream culture, the idea that we have of love which is the idea that's a sentiment on that Hallmark card. Without you, it was love at first everything. This is romantic love. This is the default value of love in our culture. Where do we get it? We get it from medieval Western culture, where romantic love became actually fetishized by the nobility at the time. So that's our default culture for love. But there are other definitions of love, and I think we see some of them coming up on this poster on the right by Joe Gonzalez of 1967 at the time of the suburb love in San Francisco. It has naked uh, women, I guess, frolicking at the top, love, a guy hanging out on a hate ashbury sign. What is the nature of that love? How is that love different from the commercialized love on a Hallmark card? Could I have the next slide, please? So I'd like to uh, introduce some ideas of what love was for the Greeks, and they had different kinds of love. One was philos, fraternal or community affinity. I think that's one of the things that we see in an image like this, this idea of an oceanic oneness with your community. That's a very vital kind of love, and I would say in this era of clashing culture wars, it's the kind of love we really need today. I think we can learn that from the counterculture. Of course, the other one is eros, sensual sexual desire, of course, when you have that many half-naked young bodies together, like, duh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a vital kind of love. Uh, so those are important kind of keywords for how the counterculture understood and manifested love. Next slide, please. And another one uh, in the Greek term is agape. That's a love bonding creator and creation. 
I think that's very much a fuel for the counterculture notion of ecological consciousness and love. And I'm showing that in a poster by the wonderful Gordon Ashby, who did this in the early 70s. This poster is called Transformer. As you can see on the left, if you see the full poster, it's a mandala, that classic image that the counterculture saw from South Asian art. But also, if we take a closer look at one of those four figures going around that circle, you can see that that figure has a vibrant heart marked out. And I'll mention that the figure is quite androgynous too, so it's, it's, not, it's not a gender figure. We see uh, vines, tendrils coming out of the umbil umbilicus connecting that figure to the biological world and the plant and animal world is flourishing with that figure. That figure is one with its environment. That figure is, I think, bonded by love with ecology. But then if we cut back to the larger mandala, if we move around the circle, we can see that when animals and those tendrils connecting it to the biome disappear, that heart grows smaller. Until in the last one, when uh, there are no animals left, the heart is gone. So in a way, the circularity of this gives us choices. Are we going to move in one direction, or are we going to move in the other? I think it's quite an amazing poster. But that's this idea of uh, agape, love bonder, bonding creator and creation, that I think is really a vital part of the counterculture legacy. Can I have the next slide? Uh, so the second term is free. And of course, the idea of free is very multiform. I mean, free can be economic. You don't have to pay for something. But free is also existential. You have no shackles. You're free. And I think all of these meanings were combined in that digger uh, philosophy. And boy, now I'm going on a limb having diggers right here to tell me, no, 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 that wasn't good enough. So uh, this digger notion of having a digger dollar, the free man of the whole world, the idea that you don't have to define your life through the constraints of buying and selling. There can be free food. There can be free stores. And also free food brings us back to love, the love of the community, bonding with the community. I think all those are implicit in the sort of incantatory power of the word free. Next slide. And of course, uh, someone who was inspired by both Diggers and LSD was the founder, David Johnson, of the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic who basically felt that to be fully human was to have the right to health. And so I think this is actually an incredibly important uh, part of this idea that the Diggers had a free city, of a free city. A free city, liberated human beings would have the right to health care. And there are many people on our panel who can uh, talk about that. Next slide, please. Finally, the outlaw. The outlaw as a figure had many different manifestations within counterculture practice. Of course, you're seeing a kind of um, poster for outlaw consciousness from the human being, this figure that clearly is manifesting a kind of acid transcendence, but also the idea of the gender outlaw. Today, when we are in battle with demonization of people in drags. Here are the Cockheads, founded in 1969, the Kate Ashbury, who are manifesting the freedom to be gender outlaws, to basically use the semaphores of gender, the clothing, the hair, the beards, the glitter, and mix and match to create new combinations. A really uh, incredible legacy of counterculture outlaw. Next, please. Uh, and the outlaw gardener, the idea that uh, people in Berkeley could claim a piece of land that was owned by the university and not used for anything, just a uh, barren parking lot made of dirt, and create a people's park. They became, I think, the first important political outlaw gardeners, and now uh, when Reagan essentially decided to create that as a culture war, we can see the result like a cop pulling up a tree. Really? That's really the best use of our police force? And uh, this poster, 
by Frank Siorka, Let a Thousand Parks Bloom, the power of choosing to be a gardener and making the world a park. Next slide. Another kind of outlaw gardener that some people here might actually be familiar with, the outlaw gardener who becomes uh, a genetic pioneer of hybridizing cannabis. And it's interesting, Doug Fur, who's also here, and now I'm gonna basically paraphrase him, tell me if I'm wrong, please, uh, the idea that the plant and humans joined forces leading human lives in new directions, to new places they might not have imagined going. For example, using the hippie, so-called hippie trail that starts in the late 1950s, where tourism opens up by bus all the way from London to uh, South Asia, as a way to go and collect genetic specimens for plants, uh, from plants to come back here and recombine them. So on the lower left, you see an Afghani land race grown in California in the late 70s. And that familiar response from People's Park to basically hammer this outlaw gardening with police power. Uh, and here in Humboldt and at the Hampa Archive, there is an incredible record of how people mobilized with their own civil power to fight and win that battle. I think it's a, it's a really important legacy that the archive holds. Next slide. Finally, the work I do is on outlaw builders. So uh, I'm showing you outlaw builders at the Wheeler's Ranch condom, also having uh, the law come down on them as, as in terms of uh, building code enforcement. And of course, Wheeler's Ranch and uh, uh, its predecessor, Morningstar, were both basically condemned and taken down to the ground. Uh, but it was here in Humboldt County, if I can catch up with my notes, that uh, people uh, challenged the county building code enforcement through civil law, lobbied and succeeded in the passage of a new, is there a problem? No, of a new Class K residential permit that allowed outlaw builders in unincorporated areas to use recycled lumber, live in their homes as they built it, uh, modify construction plans without notifying authorities, rely on wood heating and alternative energy. All of that's a Humboldt County legacy. Incredibly important. So, next slide, please. So for me, many of these things come together in the way that those outlaw dwellings were used. I'm showing you an image of a Bay Area outlaw builder, Barry Smith and his partner, in an outdoor bathtub, basically taking some a kind of piece of the house that was used in a kind of hygienic quarantine, hidden in a bathroom, right next to the place where you shit. And they're basically saying, like, wait a second, like, let's move a bathtub out under the trees and make this an amazing experience. And I think uh, if we think about outlaw builders, what architects never thought about it is that actually those buildings were installation art. They were props for life actors, as the diggers would say. People who basically looked at the roles that are prescribed and thought, I get to change this script. I get to invent new alternatives. I get to create and invent new futures. And I think that's exactly uh, why we need to look at this legacy, why we need to retrieve parts of it, to be able to invent a future that we can all inhabit. And let me say once again, this is the genetic material for activism that's in the Hapa archive. And if you should feel uh, that you would like to donate to make that archive uh, possible, I think you will find codes scattered throughout where you can donate through Venmo and other sources. So uh, thanks very much for that, and I hope that maybe we can frame a discussion as we move along on these notions of free, outlaw, and love. Thank you. So again, this is Ruth Dussault, 
and uh, she reports on systems that undergrid modern life, and that's what she's going to show you, part of a film that she worked on, uh, and uh, she is, has got a lot of awards, Society for Environmental Journals, Fund for Public Land Coverage, New Delhi International Film Festival, am I embarrassing you yet, you group? Uh, <laughs> University of Cal uh, uh, California Berkeley Journalism Fellowship and a de design award from the National Endowment for the Arts. So uh, I hope you're going to. I'm a tough act to follow. Uh, oh my God, they got me. Um, it's always hard to talk about uh, older projects that you do. Um, uh, so I'm going to have to, uh, at first, sort of contextualize the time period in which this film was made. This project began in 2012, when I was working as an artist in residence at Georgia Tech's School of Architecture. Over the next six years, I documented a range of post-recession communes. So this is after the Great Recession of 2008. Is that great? Um, I'm sorry, was it great? I thought it was set. The, the, the Great Recession, I think the Great Depression was grandma, okay. So, <laughs> so I was looking for self-sustaining experiments because I was in a design school. Unlike Greg, I sort of take an architectural avenue into the story. Um, I, and I tried my best to reach a range of bioregions. Uh, here's some of my bibliography. I think it's important to note that this project started just six years after Google Earth was released to the public five years after the iPhone. So personal technology, satellite navigation systems, social media were having its initial impact on society. So I was looking for an avenue to explore that. Um, the outputs for the project were many over such a long period of time. I made photographs, video installations, um, and two short documentary films, uh, one which I'll show you in a minute. So I was circling back to the same social landscape as the communalists of the early 70s, um, but I observed their DIY legacy had been transformed generationally with the internet from a protest against mass systems, uh, systems of mass production, right, into sort of a mass system of individual production, which you'll understand by the time I finish talking. <laughs> So my research question was basic. How was the presence of the internet changed the countercultural idea of self-sustaining community? While working at a summer class at Stanford, I, I learned that there were still people living at the Wheeler Ranch. I think they're the same, uh, same area that uh, Greg just mentioned, in rural Sebastopol. So I drove up there to see you know, who was there, expecting to find old hippies. I found young people instead. Um, and the first act of a 21st century communalist was to climb a tree and hook up a solar-powered internet router yeah. Yeah. and then download all the YouTube tutorials you need for survival in the wilderness. <laughs> so just as the communalists of the 60s used the whole Earth catalog to share and find tools for living off the land, the communalists of the 21st century were using the internet to access that same information, only at greater speed. There was lots of experiments in natural building created from materials that were salvaged and sourced locally. Um, hardware was still from Home Depot, which was also everywhere. Um, uh, it was the first, this was the first place I visited in Sebastopol. It was um, called Green Valley Village, which I think still exists as a eco-village and a market, last time I checked. Um, and this is a, a kitchen in a satellite community called Praxis. Uh, the owner of it was very upset that I had a piece of plastic in the picture. So let's get to the plastic gravity-fed water system for a treehouse dweller. Notice it's covered in bark to give it a more natural look. So now we're getting into sort of a, a almost a, 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 what Greg was referring to as performance you know, a, 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 an aesthetic uh, that I would align. I come from Florida, so like Swiss Family Robinson at uh, <laughs> Disney World. Uh, this is one of the gentlemen I met named Nick. He went to UC Santa Cruz. He built his house 40 Excuse feet me. up in a tree. UC Santa Cruz? Yay! <laughs> um, his job, 
he was 40, 40 feet up in the tree when I took this picture. His job, of course, was installing zip line rides in um, public parks around the world. Um, and uh, so he was a rural globalist, you would say. A rural globalist, right? Um, I included, for the film Ecotopia Now, I included uh, four communities for the film out of the ones that I visited. And there's sort of four chapters. There's a Skillshare near North Carolina, near uh, Black Mountain College, near Asheville, North Carolina. There's a metal fabrication lab near Kansas. Um, there's an urban eco village that's pictured here, which is near uh, Atlanta, which is where I was living at the time. And they share a lot of the same ethos as at any other eco village. Um, and then there was a, an eco village in Northeast Missouri, built by some Stanford computer science majors uh, with money that they saved up from the dot com boom. <laughs> um, one consistent element was the implementation of using the web to create educational business models. Okay, so with a web presence, a website, Communities could promote themselves as schools and offer workshops and residencies, temporary stays. Um, this is the metal fabrication lab near Kansas um, called Open Source Ecology, where the idea of free information, you know, remember this was new, free information um, via open source technologies available to everyone, uh, drew a range of people from permaculture farmers to tattoo artists to mechanical engineers to software developers. Okay, so the range of people was different. Um, in 2014, when this photo was taken, uh, the group was working on designing a building, a small scale farm equipment um, that can be replicated anywhere. So at the center of the picture is an engineering professor from Ethiopia who was funded by the state to bring this maker philosophy back to Ethiopian farmers. Yeah. So their, their, uh, their idea was uh, not to compete with John Deere and to also make design a tractor for people that's modular so that they can build it themselves. Um, attending a workshop or a residency removed the lifetime commitment of a traditional, you know, intentional community. So they were able to offer more, uh, sort of a, a more palatable experience with less economic risk or, or social dedication. Um, they designed modular agricultural farm equipment on SketchUp, which is a common open source design tool. Uh, they built prototypes, tested them until they broke, and then learned from that, discarded the prototypes, redesigned the next model, just like you do in a design school. This is, a, of course, a, a, a modular backhoe. Uh, modularity has its logics and its challenges, uh, like trying to build with an erector set, so everything has to sort of be equal dimensions. Um, sometimes the results were pretty sculptural, <laughs> um, but things, these things they built worked. They looked weird, uh, but they were you know, very artistic. They posted their plans online with downloadable blueprints and instructions and, and video, videos, how-to videos. Here's a handmade shovel built from parts you can order through Home Depot. Pretty cool looking. <laughs> Um, one, so this is how they work. One, one uh, workshop made this brick making press, a brick press. The next workshop that came through made a shovel to dig the dirt and put it into the brick press. The next workshop that came through used the bricks to make a metal shop and dorms and so on. So the participants came from all over the globe to this hard to find location in rural Missouri to build a place where they could learn. Show me so state. They, they right? paid their own. They paid their own way. It wasn't. It wasn't an exorbitant fee. That's but crazy. That's those, those are the bricks that were made in the brick press out of the dirt that they dug there. Yeah. Um, two hours to the east of Open Source Ecology is this one dancing rabbit eco village. It was started uh, again by two Stanford computing majors. Um, they vowed to work in the tech uh, industry in Silicon Valley until they could save enough money to buy land for a self-sustaining community for about a thousand people. And when I was there, I found about 50 residents. Um, it was a pretty successful community. It had its own power grid. 
Every, every house had either solar or wind power, and they made enough to share between the houses, so they connected their community, and sometimes they even sold to the, to the outside world. Um, it was begun in the 1990s. It grew, uh, the membership grew with the economic crash of the recession. Some people were there for a short term. You know, I mean, they graduated into an abyss. This was the population of graduate of college students who graduated into the worst part of the recession. And it just they were just too smart to bus tables in the city. And they still had their laptops from school. They found each other on social media and so on. But the average annual income needed to live in one of these places was about ten thousand dollars a year. So some earned it using freelance, doing freelance video production or web design or recording or producing educational content there for YouTube to share um, or production companies in Los Angeles. Somebody who was doing special effects for production so they could work. They could work with the web. Um, the second short film was about an older community built on self-sustaining concept. It's called Greater World Community in New Mexico. It was started in the 70s by architect Michael Reynolds. Um, he began as a remote radical architectural practice and he was trying to sell blueprints on the web, but after the crash, he gave that up and started making it into a school for natural building. Uh, the building walls were entirely structured from garbage. That was his philosophy. These were all tires and cans and bottles. Um, the roof was designed to collect water for drinking and cooking and cleaning. Brown water from that was used to water the plants that grew food in a, um, in a glass uh, room that faced the south. And then the water from that was recycled a third time to flush the toilets. There's no power or water or sewer lines in or out of the greater world community in New Mexico. All the buildings are ships, earth ships. So what I'm gonna show you is a six minute clip. Um, it's a montage uh, that opens the film and it's, it serves as sort of a, uh, a condensed abstract. Um, it ends at this Skillshare uh, near Black Mountain College in North Carolina. Um, the event is called Firefly Festival. It was attended by a lot of students uh, and alumni from nearby Warren Wilson College, um, where 25% of the students majored in environmental studies. A Skillshare is a week-long craft camp for camping families. It was music day in the daytime and, and classes that everybody, it was a peer-to-peer -peer classroom uh, set up on the mountainside. Peer-to-peer, -peer, just like the web. Um, and uh, then, of course, they, dread, they drummed all night. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna tell you what you're about to see. Uh, so it will make a little bit of sense. I'm sorry, the sound might be a little low, but we'll crank it up as much as possible. Um, the first thing you're gonna see is a commodity corn farm in northeastern Missouri. Uh, the voice of Marcin Jacobowski, who is the founder of Open Source Ecology, the machine shop guy. Um, the second voice of this is another OSC member talking about the economic shock that comes uh, with a tornado to a small town. Um, then you'll see a resident of Dancing Rab in Eco Village cutting grass with a scythe, uh, which brings us to the Skillshare event in the Appalachians. Uh, the landscape is slightly animated, referencing the Super Studio um, group that, uh, that uh, Greg was talking about, the 1972 film Super Surface, in which they used animations to sort of visualize the internet before it was even an idea. Um, so there's a ghostly presence of an electronic grid that's projected across the, the landscape. Okay, we ready? Here we go.
So as we drive towards an optimal system, things uh, become more complex maybe, but also adapt to one another.
intentionally developing the skills, whether these skills involve cultivating empathy and forgiveness, or learning bird language, or getting gardening, or wildcrafting in existence. I'm shooting in a band of black furs with a black, he looks like a cossack or something. He's racing across the field and he has a battle axe and he wants to kill me. <laughs> and I'm defending myself. We stand on the backs of our ancestors. <laughs> Many of whom were wise people, deeply rooted in place, in community, in laughter and grief, in humility. And in cultures that fed the land. We look to these ancestors for inspiration, guidance, and humor. As we stumble with awkwardness and occasional grace towards our potential as humans on this earth. These ancestors live in all of us and have pieces of the puzzle that we who were raised today are missing. The song goes like this. The song is called Genesis in Reverse. Genesis, Genesis, Genesis in Reverse. Ghost of coal, ghost of gas, Genesis in reverse, down the plank, two by two. Genesis acid seas, methane breeze. Genesis in reverse, burning trees, no more bees. Genesis in reverse, down the plank, two by two. Gen hey man, there go the chimpanzees. Ooh wee, they're gonna take that far. Look it, look it, they're going in backwards like it's nothing, nothing at all. Genesis. Genesis, Genesis in reverse, oil all gone, turtle song, Genesis in reverse. So compassion is what we need as we fade out of the flat five. How to make a soft landing, how to look at these beautiful mountains, to see the brownness, to see the encroachment that the boreal forests that have already experienced, that our West has already been decimated by. It, it's coming. It's coming. How to have the compassion? Morning circle. Beautiful thing here. Firefly 2015. And before I thank you, before I give up the mic, in a way this project illustrated how the communalist and countercultural values transcended into a next generation. But one of the reasons I'm here today is that I'm working on a story about aging in America. Um, and I'm interested in talking to people who migrated to Humboldt County from San Francisco in the late 60s and early 70s and learning how those countercultural values have transcended with you as you've aged. So if you fit that category or know someone I should meet, I've already talked to Jane and David, um, uh, then please come up to me and talk to me this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa. So now you've heard uh, two talks by people who would, uh, I would categorize as the observers. We watch and we report back on the things we see and in my case, seek up from archives. Now I'd like to introduce discussions and, and talks by the people I would say are doers, the really powerful people who are taking this legacy and really have for years activated it in the future, in the words of someone in the Rus uh, film, 
they are the inspiration, the guidance, and the humor as we stumble with occasional grace toward a possible future on our planet. So let me first introduce uh, Leslie Castellano, is an artist, Eureka City Commissioner, uh, a counselor of arts and culture, an administrator, a director and a community organizer who works collaboratively in order to create opportunities for community well-being. Uh, she has, uh, I'm sorry, uh, she is engaged with creative practices as a tool for connecting with place, land, and social change for two decades. Uh, Leslie, please. Hey. Um, I'm going to say, would it be helpful for the, for the audience to have some lights on us now? Okay. Would, if you don't mind, if, if we could turn the lights on again on the stage. Thank you. Very exciting. Um, thank you. Is this, I think this will be okay. Um, thanks, everyone, for having me here. I feel very humbled to be um, you know, amongst people who I think created and paved, not paved, but maybe the unpaved <laughs> the territory in which I you know, found myself, in which I really developed my thinking in this community. Um, I moved here from Florida, um, fresh out of uh, New College, which is a school that uh, DeSantis is uh, systematically dismantling right, right now, or, you know, as over the last couple of years year or so, uh, which somehow seems uh, and important to this conversation. Um, you know, my time here over the last, gosh, 25 years has been varied. Uh, I was thinking about this idea of outlaw and how um, my life now is perhaps, for sure, more on the inside than it has ever been in the past in terms of um, you know, I'm, I'm representing the people of Eureka as an elected official. I'm on you know, many boards and commissions and really kind of working to inhabit that space, I would say, inside the dominant culture. Um, and in some ways, in, in, in thinking about the discussion earlier, I was really thinking about uh, problematizing uh, the relationship between inside and outside. I think that you know, perhaps this idea of the counterculture is, is really valuable, but as someone who's situated now, I, I like to hope or imagine that there are opportunities for you know, permeation of counterculture or counterculture ideologies within you know, more, uh, let's say, domestic or contained spaces. And, and something um, that I think about is this relationship of tight spaces. So. You know, when you're inhabiting the problem or, or when you're kind of situated in a space in which uh, your, your movements or your articulation of change is constrained by the structures in which you find yourself, um, how, like, how do you within that create opportunities for liberation and joy? Um, and, you know, I, for myself, so I am a dancer, I'm, I'm a performance artist, I continue to work and practice as a dancer and performance artist, um, you know, even as I uh, have these other jobs and roles in the community, and so really that training and that relationship I have with artistic practice and creative practice has informed the way I, I exist in the world and how I experience the world. Um, for the last 20 plus years, I've studied compact improvisation, which actually, for the, the film that we just showed, I would say the dancers maybe aren't like pro deeply proficient in compact improvisation, but, but we're for sure informed by it. And I think about um, how these body-based practices actually have kind of permeated the ideas of the counterculture and how embodiment of change is something that I, you know, the, the hopeful part of me thinks that you know, through embodied practices, there's the opportunity to really, uh, through those tight spaces, to kind of erupt um, uh, like moments of joy and love you know, in, in what we do. And, and I do truly believe like, the, the power of the practice of care and how that um, is really like, where change is possible. And in, in, you know, whether out, you know, on the periphery or, or deeply, deeply inside. Um, my teachers, some of my teachers were 
um, Anne Halperin, who really, um, you know, in terms of performance, like, but also really, I think, was was someone who was deeply connected to that, um, back to the land and uh, connection with nature and place. Um, she, you know, she was, I think, the first dancer who took her clothes off on stage. You know, in a, a, a you know, a, a large scale performance. And you know, I had the privilege of working with her out in her studio in Marin. Um, on her, you know, she's this outdoor. She's no longer alive. Uh, but thank you, Anna. But she, you know, had this beautiful space where people could come and work outside and be in relationship to land and nature. And then also, I, for many, for about 20 years, I also studied buto, which is a Japanese dance form that was informed by the, um, the atomic bomb in Japan in terms of it was a group of dancers who were studying contemporary dance at the time and then were um, you know, deeply impacted by this experience in Japan and how they, they had to find something that had a greater sense of immediacy in terms of responding to the, the socio-culture cultural situation and, and health situation that they are experiencing. And so Buto very much, uh, my teacher actually is uh, a Mexicano teacher who lives in Mexico, Diego Pinon, who studied in Japan. And so I still um, have the opportunity now and again to go down and work with him and work with him on his land and, you know, building his studio with him as students, you know, as we work on his land. And, and that practice very much is about like creating psychological situations, like internalized that you're wrestling with, I would say, contradictions between ideas of like self, other, of you know, good, bad, of, you know, of like feminine, masculine, and then trying to embody those questions deeply. Like some people say it was about studying the body at the point of crisis, which I feel very much, you know, in relationship to the you know, ecological and sociological space in which we find ourselves that, you know, that um, we are at a place of crisis where we need to know how to use the poetic as an invitation to other and to uh, innovation and response that continues to center care and authenticity you know, in relationship to that. Um, so, you know, all of these things, and I just want to lift up, um, you know, when I came out here, I came out here with basically nothing, camped in the woods for a month, you know, somehow, amazingly, this, I don't think this would happen anymore, someone rented my friends, you know, my like seven friends and I a place, um, <laughs> which is like, how is that even possible? Like, not possible, you know, in today's real estate market, probably, um, but, you know, and, um, started teaching preschool, um, did a lot of Tai Chi for pretty seriously for, for many years, and then um, got involved just you know on the periphery really at the Peace and Justice Center, and this is, and then um, you know post uh, World Trade Organization protests in Seattle got really involved with the Sustainable Communities Bioliberal Roadshow, which was you know a group of us going around. I know there's some people in the audience who I think were, were part of that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, going around to protest, you know, still walking, wearing costumes, doing all the things, and um, you know, and though I wasn't deeply involved with the Peace and Justice Center, I just want to say that things like that and the, the reverberations of all of these institutions that people build have a resonance and have a legacy that you know may be indirectly impacting you know the communities we're building even as we're building them today, and and just to continue to. Like whatever you're doing out there in the world, like keep trying and keep building spaces, and you know, and, and I think those you know, liminal spaces, those temporary autonomous zones, those you know, those like just because something isn't forever doesn't mean that it is not valuable. Um, I'm kind of rambling, but that's okay. Um, you know, and so that was kind of like my my beginnings here, and then you know. For the last 20 years, I've had the opportunity to kind of tend to a project called Synapsis, the Synapsis Performance Collective, 
in which, uh, yeah, in which, you know, through kind of a disorganized system, we really tried to, you know, everything, all of this national expenses have always been no one turned away for lack of funds. There's always a pay what you can option. Um, but really, again, trying to create these spaces where, you know, we, we got to that just because we wanted a place to practice still walking and building giant puppets to go to protest. And then, you know, over the years, it's kind of become this thing that somehow still exists. And, you know, I've done all kinds of wild things to keep it going, you know, including like living out of my van and traveling around and, you know, and, like, working at all the odd jobs in Humboldt County. Um, you know, and, you know, with that, though, the, it's, the sense of the visionary, um, you know, and the dedication to the visionary has really kept me going in terms of, um, you know, knowing that, I mean, and also the privilege of that, right? Like, you know, to, there's a certain privilege of saying, like, I can live out of my van and survive and, you know, and like not be totally othered by society and not and have those access points. And just, to recognize that also within the counterculture there's this real privilege of like who gets to participate and who doesn't and I do think that you know there's a, a necessity to always be reflecting on like who doesn't have access to liberatory practices and why you know and, and how do we do that in our society and I'm looking at Nezi right here because I just want to like acknowledge like the work that Nezi is like, always do really be critical about these questions. Um, and just to say, how did I get to city council <laughs> from, you know, from all of that? Um, you know, there are quite a few projects along the way, but um, one of the ones that, you know, and I've had a great opportunity to experiment in different ways, but one of the projects that, um, that really influenced me was actually a, a space in which I collaborated with Unesi, and that was this um, this project called All Are Welcome, which was uh, when I had synapses. The original synapsis was down by Free Meal in Old Town, uh, and so you know through that project, I I was there for 13 years um, every day in that building, and so became friends with many of the people who are also unhoused or you know, my neighbors in the area. And um, the, the warehouse next to Synapses was going to be empty for a period of time. And so some, some friends, collaborators got together and we decided to, um, what if we, so I believe strongly in performance making is postulating worlds. And so we framed this as a performance of society. And so the, the idea is what if we had 10 days and we, you know, the, the only agreement was mutual respect. And we tried to provide all of the basic necessities, you know, basically, um, you know, a place to rest, uh, food, you know, meal, meals throughout the day, um, conviviality. Um, we made a cave for storytelling because we felt like stories were kind of necessary to this world. And, you know, within that, like everyone, Everything was free, everything was always available, and you know, there were about 40 people who participated, maybe more, over you know, those 10 days, and you know, people who were unhoused had been you know, recently out of incarceration, um, people who were, you know, had disabilities, people who you know, were artists, collaborators, you know, basically people. Um, and, like, I mean, the painful part of that project was that it was temporary, right? You know, and it was, the, there were the fact is that, like, you know, in that moment, we weren't able to sustain the, that liberated space. And, um, but at the same time, like, and I, I wasn't able to get the, my slides were the same, but like the, like the faces of the people who I was able to, like love deeply in those 10 days, like will always, it, like really call me to like run for city council, you know, and, and just be like, okay, like how, how can I use my energy and like my care to like try to 
expand what was possible in that temporary space. And I wouldn't say I'm succeeding, you know? I mean, like, I definitely think that, like, most of the time I fail, you know, or that, you know, like, these are, like, experiments and we're trying, and but just that, like, you know, and, and that's where I think that there constantly has to be this kind of cycling and, and of, of, like, how do we try and fail and, you know, how are we accountable with one another and leaning on one another to continue to try Thank you very much, Roby. And uh, now, uh, I'm sorry, thank you very much, Leslie. Now I'd like to introduce Roby, uh, Tenario, who lives on the Matolo River at the confluence of Matolo Canyon Creek. She lives with her partner on their homestead where she grows food, practices stream and land restoration, and volunteers on several community projects. project so that we um, could get some control over our lives, which we had had an enormous amount of control over our lives, which was a beautiful thing. And the reason that we were able to form those groups, I think, so easily is because we had already formed ourselves into working affinity groups. Um, and we went through nonviolent trainings that focused on nonviolent direct action and nonviolent civil disobedience. And we formed um, affinity groups that traveled to different areas and focused on resisting nuclear weapons, nuclear war. Uh, we went to Nevada test site. We went to uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base. Um, uh, Conquered naval weapons stations where they shipped the weapons out to Vietnam, but we went there when they were shipping them to Central America. And we went off, sat on the tracks, and um, most of our actions ended in arrest. But when we went through nonviolence training, what we learned um, was con the consensus process of how you make a decision as a group. And um, the first training I took was from the Quakers, and the Quakers have been using consensus for hundreds of years, and they have a, a commitment to a higher power that allows them to make that commitment that's really hard to do, to use consensus. And so a lot of people try consensus, and it frustrates them no end. And you just don't even want to be in a group that uses consensus. But, but Really, we were really fortunate because we felt that we were on the edge of the end of the world, with nuclear war coming down upon us, and who knew it was going to be worse now than it was then. But um, we, we had this bigger, broader thing coming down upon us, and so I think we were able to commit to this idea of um, bonding with each other as an affinity group and bonding to the use of consensus and bonding to, most importantly, nonviolence. And taking that commitment and 
doing direct action. And of course we did many other things. Of course we wrote letters and we uh, called our representatives and we went to various municipal buildings and state buildings and we did all of the very nice direct action. And we became ready to take it further and we did put our bodies on the line and ended up going to jail quite a few times. Um, so when camp came, we went, wow, we, let's organize and have a citizen's observation group and let's do nonviolent training. And so as a collective, we developed a nonviolent training for cops. And um, at the same time as camp came, the state started a um, apple maggot eradication program. And so the Department of Agriculture was also in the neighborhood spraying trees. So at the same time as we were doing the COG, uh, we were getting calls from communities like Rio Dell, who were not part of our counterculture community as much uh, then. <laughs> and um, we went there and did not buy the trainings for them so that they could resist the apple mega spray. And they wanted to go out, they, they came up with ideas in the training, they said, we're gonna go out and you know, not use our guns, we're just we're gonna spray them with water. <laughs> and um, we, we sort of talked about it. In, in, in the trainings, you do um, a lot of role plays. So you put yourself in a position with your fellow um, participants and you work out a lot of what your fears are and, and how you can handle a situation with the idea of nonviolence. We also go through a lot of brainstorming. Um, what what does nonviolence look like? What does violence look like? And so we in the training you have a, a, a opportunity to process those things. And so just for example in Rio Dell, it was like, well, what about if we just turn on the water? So when they come, they, they can't really do it. And it was like watching these beautiful breakthroughs of people going, right, yeah, let's do that. And um, so the, the whole idea of the nonviolent direct action, nonviolent civil disobedience, um, allowed us to share that with a lot of other places because then um, we were asked to go to Oregon because there was forest defenders there who were having serious problems with sheriffs and there was a fair amount of violence exchanged. So we were um, able to go up there and do a training for forest defenders and the sheriff's department who came to the same training. The sheriffs were all in uniform with weapons and the uh, forest defenders came and it was a, it was a um, remarkable experience for all of us. And what the trainings do is have you try and with, with that particular training, what was so beautiful and important was the exchange of what was difficult. What was difficult for the sheriffs was that there was no hierarchy with the forest defenders. They couldn't get anyone to say who was in charge. And so, you know, for the forest defenders, by the end of the training, they could understand that that was difficult. And so they made concessions to give the officers a way to communicate to them. And for the officers, they couldn't understand how someone could break the law and do this. And so in our role plays, we discussed what were hard issues for all of us. And of course, we all shared, well, the medical care and hospitals, those are really hard for everybody. Also taxes are really hard for everybody. So in one of our role plays, we had a position where um, there was gonna be a, a um, tax repossession of someone's home. And it happened that the sheriffs were all together and it was their home. And they decided they were gonna lock arms <laughs> and prevent their repossession. And they locked <laughs> arms and started singing Kumbaya. <laughs> It was, it was, <laughs> a kumbaya moment. A kumbaya moment. Douglas is one of my fellow nonviolent trainers and 
uh, we've been all over doing these trainings together. Um, so we were able to, to um, share this incredible training and organizing ability. And I think that that's why um, our area benefited so much, so much and was able to form COG and Clint so quickly. I'm not saying we, we wouldn't have done that anyway, but we really had the tools at our disposal. And um, I'll make one more comment that the, one of the slides that you showed, Greg, really, I, I felt that the, the mandala with the connection to nature, I feel that that, um, I, I always felt from the moment I came to Humboldt County that I was the luckiest person in the world. And um, here I was surrounded by natural beauty with just cool, educated people everywhere. And um, we all had that in common that we were so happy to be in nature. And we were so happy to be surrounded by a natural environment that we, we had so much love in, in that understanding and, and with each other. And um, right now, Southern Humboldt is going through a, a bit of a crisis, but I, I feel that we have so much going for us in the young people um, who have taught us how to better take care of ourselves more than we ever were. The, the young people have started these incredible um, fire departments. I mean, they've brought them to life. And we have the best uh, volunteer fire department. And, um, and, now, and now they're evolving to become, uh, to help themselves get work, uh, clearing the land. Because as we were all hanging out, enjoying ourselves, the trees have taken over the meadows. And, and we have a lot of work to do on the land. Um, to improve the health of the land. And the young people um, are, are helping us understand how to do that. So I, I don't feel hopeless about our situation. I feel like we have a lot to build on. And um, I think that the nonviolent direct action is uh, a tool that can be used everywhere. It has been used we, when we were active and going to all these um, anti-nuclear sites, um, I mean, nuclear sites that we wanted to be anti-nuclear. Um, there was people from all over the world. It was a, a, it was a global movement. And um, we have just as many as are more problems right now. And I think that we need more direct action. We need more civil disobedience to say, we've had enough, we know how to do it differently. <laughs> because I had participated in that before I moved to Humboldt County in 70. Yes, and then when, when I came to Humboldt County, um, I, I had done several trainings on how to be a trainer, and so I um, offered a training to go to Diablo Canyon and met a whole bunch of really great people that came to do that training. And after going to Diablo Canyon, a few times over and over until it started and went online. Um, we, we did other trainings. Uh, we, we developed a collective and with the nonviolent um, training collective. And then we did trainings for, for everyone. We, and then we, we even went into the Headwaters Forest campaign and helped them with their trainings. Um, we also developed our own um, training for peacekeepers. So if you were going to have an event and you wanted people to, you know, participate and know where to go and do things like that, we developed a peacekeeper. And then we did also a uh, legal observer training that we developed. Um, I, one little quick thing that we did, um, Douglas and I did with, with you, Anna, was um, the Mateo Community Center was um, putting on a show called Reggae down on the river. And at that point, 
um, a lot of young hippies were coming into town and really the merchants were so upset. And the, they would sort of spill out of their vehicles in front of stores and be keep kind of on the street and the merchants wanted to shut Reggae down. And um, Anna, who was, were you on the board of the Mateel? Yeah. So Anna was on the board of the Mateel and she said, we should do some kind of town, town, patrol. town patrol. And so she asked Douglas and I, do you want to help? And so we developed the town patrol training that uh, was a direct action. And we helped the visitors know what was expected of them when they were in Garberville and how to interface with the merchants. And they worked in pairs and it was all about nonviolent communication so that you could meet people where they were at and help them be more comfortable and help them understand that certain things were expected of them. So nonviolence is, is um, we were doing this before the whole word nonviolent communication got going and, and now I'm so happy that, that that's out there. We'll have more time for questions and answers and comments. Uh, but I'd like to do thank you so much for Obi. That was fantastic. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Sunshine Sixera. She was one of the first cannabis dry farmers in Humboldt County. The plants grow under the sun and uh, without added water in the Eel River Basin, uh, floodplain deposits. And she continues to refine the art of minimal interference in cannabis uh, cultivation. Uh, let me move this mic over to you, Sunshine. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Hoppa, for just bringing us all together. It's uh, wow, it's amazing. Really good to be here and see everyone's faces. It's a lot of history here. And um, now I wasn't quite the first one to dry farm in the Eel River Valley or where I live. Um, it was a very like first time I dry farmed. It was 2017, I believe, and. I'd always wanted to try it, and I had a sneaking suspicion it could be done. Well, across the way, Shively, they've been dry farming for many, many, many years. And I was invited by my dear friend over there to Alluvium Organics. And she said, Sunshine, yeah, come, come and see, come and see these plants. And so, and I, you know, the, the bridge wasn't in yet, and they swam across the river, and I, it was great, it was beautiful. I walked to her farm, and she was, she wanted me to see her plants when they're at the very end of their suffering. They were terrible. They're just yellow and droopy. And she's like, you see this little bit of green here? And I looked and I saw it. And I was like, yeah, she's like, they're, they're taken. I took my, I, I, did, I didn't just do a few plants. I did like maybe 90 and they were my best plants. So I went for it and of course I got, oh my gosh, it was like the most, honestly, I was pretty scared. I was really freaked out for about a week. And she told me, she goes, well, you know, if you water a few, they actually don't do as well. They don't take as well. And so I got a little scared. And I watered maybe a dozen or so. They didn't do so well. But they came out, they were a little slower, but they did all right. The dry farming was a, it was a good experience because I, you know, I just, I had to really let go of control and I didn't really realize how much control I really was thinking. Like, well, I want to spray this on my plants and, and I want to fertilize with this and I can make this groovy this and groovy that, whatever concoction I want. And I was like, no, you just gotta leave them alone. And really, I just want to see what would happen if I did nothing. I was like, let's just see what you get before you start about adding stuff. Just see what happens doing nothing. Plants, they just turned into the most luscious, beautiful green. It was like, it's like they were just living off the grid or something. They were just like, <laughs> they were, they were independent ladies. They were living on their own knees. No staking them, no stretching them out. They were just growing nat naturally. So I've been doing that ever since. And um, I just really enjoy, I really enjoy I just, it's like there's something amazing about just producing something from the earth and then crafting with it and making something out of it. So over the years, I, um, I, I just, there's a lot of mental constructs that come around you as a grower from the camp experiences and just everything, right? So, 
So when I was young, I just I smoked a bunch of weed and I just went through all my oppressive thought processes. I just wanted to like free my mind of every mental construct. And this is what like, really benefited me and just in my craft, in what I do, in, in my art, to just come at it with this free mind. And and one of the things is like, you know, when you stop, when you just stop thinking about the plant as money, there's endless possibilities. Endless. There's so many possibilities. Like, wow, I can do this, I can do that. And then you're like, okay, well maybe I'll figure out a way to monetize it or something. You know, but wow, it's just a lot of cool things. So um, so then, um, so I grew up in Southern Humboldt. I came to Southern Humboldt in the back of a VW van in like 1980, listening to Peter Tosh, looking at the Redwoods, and of course, same thing. I saw the Redwoods, and I was like, oh, I'm the lucky girl, this is the best. And I was just like this free spirited wild child. And we lived, we camped out that first year all around wherever <laughs> and um so we started this was like right before camp so i got to see a pretty special time right then and people were growing they just figured out they're like okay we can grow some centimia and they're just figuring it out and it wasn't really so it had nothing to do with money nothing it was just about growing some good herbs and it was also, and then when the money did come, it was to use it for other things, it was to do something else. And one of the things was it funded, because I was raised primarily by around activists and activism, and so dissent was just, it's just my nature. Um, I was just around a lot of that, and so that was just, that was a part of growing too, is that it was this act civil disobedience, I guess, like, well, you're not supposed to grow, and you are, and so I was very fortunate, too, to be in a community of growers, and so other kids who lived in other places, they had to hide it from, you know, couldn't bring friends home, and this and that, but everyone's growing, and so we were just in this beautiful bubble, all grown weed, and it was awesome, <laughs> and so <laughs> the funny story is that, um, I, you know, I've, I had a lot of alternative education, thank goodness, because I, li I started off in public school, but I was such a nonconformist. I was a nonconformist in an already nonconformist school. Like, I was like, all right, thank goodness for that. And so, some of my former teachers are here, Jane, David, and David serves as well. So yeah, um, but I started off at Fire Creek School, it was this, one room schoolhouse and out in Andersburg. And I walked out, you know, just walking in the woods, went by a pack full of oranges and donuts. You know, the school's off the grid. We, we cleaned the school, we carried lumber to build the teacher's schoolhouse. And then also, my school is like, one of the things that was so beautiful was that we were, we were, um, really encouraged to be like spirit, spiritual beings. And so we were in fourth grade learning astrology. We were reading some arrows. We were reading Kaiser, you know, being read to with Kaiser stories. And so it was just being out there wild and, and having and being encouraged to have these conversations with adults about spirituality too. It was, it was good. And then so then when like when the whole the whole war on drugs came in, it was definitely, I mean, there was a commodity of being outlaws back then. But we weren't really outlaws. I mean, maybe we became outlaws when camp started. I'm not really sure how what's really made of that, but um so at that time the helicopter, I mean it was like they were just terrorizing young families. And they were just they were just circling in, and they just they were just out of bounds. They were like out in the woods, just doing whatever they wanted, and tearing apart homesteads and plants. And so the citizens' observation group began. My mom went to that first meeting. There was no four-wheel drive. Like everyone's out there just in there. I think my mom had a Dodge Dart at the time. <laughs> and um, 
So they followed the helicopters and they recorded what was happening. And then from that, he came to see where you put your thumb up in the air. And it's like the helicopter was like bigger than your thumb. Then they were flying too low. They couldn't fly around our houses anymore. So where do you think we were all growing? We were like tucking in around our houses, this and that. So I was remembering that plants humble rice when you were in there. And I was like, wow, it's like the old days. Like plants around your house. It's cool. So, so yeah, we, uh, um, yeah, just going back to the education part, um, and then from fire preschool, I went to beginnings. I got a little taste of sky, sky high and Bryceland, but that was like 30 closes by the time I started there. But, um, and I went to Petroli High School. Um, I had seen it. And then I went there, and then before I went there, though, there was like, there was there was a tuition to go. And my mom set me up under the plum tree. She's like, all right, you grow your plant here, and this is what's going to get you your tuition to patrol it. And I was like about 15, and I was like the only freshman. So, so yeah, I just started growing then, too. And, um, yeah, so it was just, and then, um, it, Petrolia High School, wow, what an amazing education, in fact, land education, really learning to be self-resourceful, but also about being citizens and what it means to be a citizen. So you're in like this, like, different kind of, kind of education, and in some ways I feel like I learned more about being a citizen in my my alternative education, the kids who came out of public school are like, you're funded by like government money and this and that, like the government should care about creating citizens. Why am I, I you know, a better sense of that? But, and so um, from school, I, uh, I I did a bit, I made it to the university, I don't know how I did it, but somehow I did and I studied geology and then just loving all the work about rocks and the earth and then from there I went on to, um, I started brokering wine and through the experience of wine is where I really like a lot of how I identify with my use of cannabis and my craft it just it all came out of that experience of eating winemakers and the decisions that they make and how they craft and, and I also learned about you know the business and how to navigate through distribution and all the perils to that anyway I learned a lot and so now I'm just uh, living there in Dry Farm in the Eel River Valley, and I'm working on my craft and thinking about about you know about the future and, and where we're going now, and especially just just a lot of polarization across the country, and it's so important to be just to find a moderate voice and to get past all this polarization because we got so tough times. It's going to be important that we, that we unite and come together and be resourceful. So thank you. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Lorraine Carolyn, who's lived in Humboldt since 1969, and is a community-based birth and health worker. Urban migration in 1969. 
I had stopped hitchhiking across country, I'd done it numerous times, and decided to settle down and headed north with my friend Annie and two dogs. And we stumbled into a tavern in Fort Bragg, and we were wet and cold, and they let our dogs in, so that was cool. And some guys came up to us and bought us coffee and said, where are you heading? We said, someplace that feels like home. And they told us about this place called Teepee Town. And so we went, okay, it's out of Garberville. So we hitchhiked to Garberville. And headed out west to Whitethorn. And that felt like we had hit home. I felt the same way. I thought, this is paradise. This is like the most beautiful place in the world. And somehow I got involved in healthcare after I, I'd never gone to doctors or anything. And I got pregnant with my son and previous to that, because Whitethorn at that time had a library, so I read everything I could and a couple of friends had babies and they said, would you help us? So I said, sure, and I read the two books that were written about childbirth at the time and sat with them while they did all the work and had their babies. I went, wow, this is pretty magical. And something you were saying, Leslie, about space and tightness and liberation, and that's what birth is, right? And when you emerge like that in a safe place and allow that process to evolve, then that's what humans are meant to do. And that experience was not replicated when I went to the hospital to have my son. And I'm like, this, there's something a little off here, but I had had a lovely public health nurse get so excited that she finally had someone that she could teach breathing and Lamaze to. So she, I remember in the midst of this um, chaos when my eight family friends arrived with this pregnant, laboring woman in Garberville Hospital, and the hospital kind of freaked out and went, you guys out. And I remembered what Sally Nixon, the public health nurse, had said, just ask for a quiet room and do your breathing. So I did that and managed to divert my um, cesarean section, which they had told me I was going to have, and almost delivered my baby in that quiet room. But that was transcendent for me, and it was an important moment. The, um, I think all of us have, have stories that reflect what was an inflection moment in our lives. And I remember going back and sitting on the curb with two friends outside the hospital in Barberville, and they were telling their stories, not of birth, but of how they had been treated in other places with their medical conditions. And I was talking about mine, and I just said, there's got to be a better way. And at this point, because I had had a child and had assisted a few other women, and I think Jane can relate to this, you became kind of the midwife. And that wasn't exactly the way to go about it, but Eventually, my friend Kate Lanigan and I began assisting people at their births, and we provided what has become known as the midwifery model of care. 
And at that point, it was basically, we just asked all the questions we could about their life and their health and what was going on with them. And now people call it holistic care. But at that point, it was, if we know enough about them, then we can provide better care for them. And we got involved a little bit with, um, with, with a man up here who was training um, midwives. And so Kate and I would come up and take classes from him. And mainly the connection we made was with my dear friend, uh, Gina Kennington, who was also, who was a doctor and working with the um, open door clinic, which was just starting. And they created a mobile medical clinic. So we started working with them and having women we were seeing come to their little van. And at one point, we decided that what we needed was a space in town. And most people were hitchhiking or had pretty funky vehicles. Nobody had phones. So we thought, if we have a little storefront that has a bathroom and a phone, we'll have people come in. And it worked. We had, and once a month or so, the mobile clinic from Open Door would come down, and about you know two or three days a week, one of us would be at that little storefront. Anyway, it, it one day some guy came in and said, "I hear you've got a telephone in the bathroom." And he said, "Yeah." And they said, "I also heard you were." kind of a medical clinic, and he's looking around at this storefront. And I said, well, we have the mobile clinic and we're trying to raise money for it, but we don't. He said, do you need a doctor? And I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Irv Tesla. And Irv came in, and he said, well, I'm a psychiatrist, but that's a doctor. And we're like, that's exactly the kind of doctor you want. And so that kind of began to be um, beginnings of Ridley's world. And what we created at that time was very community-based. And we utilized what is now called the midwifery model of care for all of our care. And that meant we saw the entire person within the context of not just their body and their ailment or their disruption in that body, but also within their family unit, within the, their neighborhood, their community, and the planet. And all of us had come from a place of activism, all of us who had started that clinic. And it was a collective effort. It was not around one person or one doctor. And in fact, the doctors <laughs> took the back seat a lot, and that was hard for their ego, but really helpful for their care. And we learned a lot about each other and the approaches to our care. I continued my studies as did Kate. We both became PAs, um, but never lost that sense that what was important was the entire person and they knew their story better than anyone listening. And what you had to do was listen and hear them and let them know that. And that was establishing a place of trust and allowing people to participate in their care 
engage them in a way that uh, validated them that probably hadn't happened uh, most of their life. As midwives, we were attempting to create a place where every child who was born wanted and in a safe and healthy environment. Um, and, and we achieved a lot through that time. I think, however, it was a bubble and we were, we had a hard time when keeping things alive, keeping the place going. And when managed care came through in the eighth, late 80s and 90s, people would know those dates better than me. I just remember the ramifications of it. Suddenly we were given 15 minutes to see patients, and that didn't work for us. And we had a difficult time with that, and things, things changed a lot. Um, I kept going back to thinking about how when we were sitting on that curve in front, we didn't want to create the same kinds of institutions that had failed us. And I think what Groby was saying and what everyone is kind of touched on is that the nature of what created the communities in Southern Humboldt and many other places was that we were creating collectively institutions in a sense, but they were from the ground up rather than hierarchical down and when managed care hit, all of the um, all of the clinics in the area were changed, and the what some of us did, what I did, was take my midwifery practice out of the clinic so that it was um, not constrained by those, those uh, dictates from insurance companies. Um, but the nature of our community-based healthcare and midwifery care is community-based is really an important part of it because that's who informs the care and even Red Woods Rural now has never lost sense of their mission, even though I've not worked with them for 20 years. They are still attempting, or once more, attempting to be as community-based as possible. And I think seeing that, seeing how the seeds that were planted is the most important thing that we can say, that if we look at, like no, no experiment has failed. Everything is building on the next iteration of it. And we created at that moment something really important and our children and their children are reflecting that. And whether, it, I mean, my son was 11 years old at, when he was handcuffed at Diablo <laughs> And, you know, we, I remember how poorly so many of us were treated and, you know, maybe 15 years into my first work at the clinic, um, 
it was a surreptitious lunch and they were honoring a couple of us as the healthcare providers. And I looked around at this group and I saw one woman and I went, oh, hi, your husband shot at me when I first came to Wake Thorpe. And I looked at another and I'm like, oh, and you had to sign up. No shoes, no, no, no shoes, no shirt, no service, and no breastfeeding allowed here in this restaurant. In this, and you know, no hippies allowed. And I didn't say anything, I just noticed. But when I did get my award at the time, I thanked them and I said, I was one of those people in the street. And I was dressed in ladies' silk underwear and rolling around barefoot and being called a dirty hippie. And I've caught most of your children and grandchildren. And we've created an incredible series or an incredible set of clinics in both these towns that are strong and vibrant. And I want you to remember when you look at these trimigrants that you're now asking us not to, to um, accept in our community. When you're looking at people that you are now calling ragged, reggae hippies, that in five or 10 years, they may be treating your broken arm or your menopause. They are not anything other than human. And I was one of them, and so were you. And they were very responsive to that, all of those women in that surroundings group. And I think that we have to keep looking at the big picture. One of the things I really want to mention is that, and I sort of said it before, but none of this was done by one person. And we brought to this area, especially Southern Humboldt, a sense of collectivity, a sense of connection, and we celebrated we celebrated with collective joy, as, as Barbara Ehrenreich would call it, a communal joy. Reggae was communal joy. And we had firemen's hall boogies to raise money for all of our, our institutions that we were creating. And we created institutions that did not fail us. And the image and the pattern of those institutions are embedded in our children and in their children. And I, Pollyanna in hell, I am really <laughs> have a lot of hope for what's happening now. So, Sincere thanks and gratitude for all of you. That's an incredible legacy of community activism. And I'm just in awe. Thank you so much. And so, <laughs> if Nicole is out there, I know that we're running a little Nicole late. Is here. Okay. And so um, I know we're running a little late. We need to clear the stage of like maybe five minutes for question and answer. Is that okay? Or is that too short? How does that sound to all of you? About five minutes for questions and answers? Five or ten. Five or ten. And okay. then we have Jane of Inner that's going to perform.
I'm just showing this for the back of the way. I'm just curious, like, you all have a beautiful panel of people. And I'm just really curious if, if everybody out there is accepting of other perspectives that are more violent and then people who advocate as the Antipos and Leslie Castellano, who is part of your board, who is also the executive director of the Hebrew board, who have supported this violent group called Humboldt Grassroots for many years in our community, who are anarchists and who actually advocate for violence in our community. And I'm just wondering why you all belong with her, like why is she here? I'm just curious if you are all okay with the violence and the anarchy that her organization supports called Humble Grassroots. Look them up. Her group has advocated, incubated, and have been a part of this group. So I think why is she up to I think you've asked I'm her curious, I'd like to know. And I would like to hear the answer to your Thank you. I appreciate that. Hello, Provocateur. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm a cannabis person. I served seven months in public health. I'm not here. The Indian people, though I'm not here specifically tonight representing the Indian people. The Indian people is a long standing um, Humboldt County institution. Uh, since 1979 that supports uh, a number of different programs in the community. We, our largest program is called the Dream Maker Program, in which we support grassroots arts and culture initiatives. Um, we've supported hundreds of different initiatives over the years. Uh, some of our most uh, active initiatives right now are groups like Black Humble, HC, Black Music and Arts,
Yeah, it was actually something from when you were talking. Um, you were, you'd mentioned um, just like you know free food and free health care, and but on those grounds, like someone has to provide those. So if it's free, I mean, would you consider that also inflate you know enslaving somebody to providing those things? Well, this the taxpayers. Well, um, Any hands make work, yeah. Buddy. These things were provided on a voluntary basis, mm -hmm. so I don't think like the. The doctor who started the free clinic considered himself enslaved. He considered himself someone who was contributing to the liberation of other people. I don't think uh, anyone who provided those services for free, food, medical care, uh, uh, clothing that was redistributed, considered themselves slaves in that process. Far from it. I think they considered themselves liberating themselves and other people from a kind of economic situation. Yeah, yeah. I'm just talking about when, when it becomes, you know, a mandated thing. You know, when it's when it becomes a mandated thing. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, understandable. Okay, well, 